Welcome, traveler. Atik Prior has missed you. Also, that's the name of the planet. Uh, I don't think we showed that last time. In case you missed him, this is what the first 100 days on the moon looked like. What the hell? You're consuming a nutrient paste meal. The child is dying. Okay. No more refugees on the moon. A woman is giving birth. Beck, please. Oh, we're like completely out of food. Oh, I'll, uh, I'll take on 19 alpha beavers for a TV. Wasn't that just a riot? Anybody catch the beaver soil itself while decompressing? What a game, baby. Regardless, we asked if you wanted to see another 200 days of this nightmare, and you all cried out in a single, booming voice. No. But we went ahead and made it anyway. This time we've got raids, we've got robots, we've got asteroids, and so much more. We've also learned a lot about making these videos since the first one, largely due to your comments and suggestions. So feel free to file your complaints with Magic and I over on our court-mandated Discord server. I've also gone ahead and updated the mod list, and it all seems to be working now, but it will definitely not pay rent. You'll find links to everything in the description, and so, without further ado, here's the next 200 days on the moon. As if to reward us for continuing the great work, baby Mindy went ahead and recovered from her illness before we even started. Hey, Mindy's healed. That is, that is like genuinely, in, like great for Mindy. Horrendous for the storytelling, but uh, I guess, I guess we'll work with what we've got, yeah? Do you smell that? That's the smell of moon poop, baby. We're back and due to popular demand, we're running the Dubs Bad Hygiene mod. This adds in toilets, showers, sinks, plumbing, and the desperate need in your colonists to fill them all up. We'll start off by figuring out what this water stuff is, and then working out how to put it into a pipe. That wasn't the only big change to the mod list though, as Rimnauts 2, the mod that actually adds the moon to the game, has now been updated to allow raids to spawn in. Since a tick prior has been wiped clean of all tax paying life, the only things left to attack us are Jeff's pesky drones. Up until this point, we haven't needed guns, and so the only thing we've got to defend ourselves with is this EMP grenade launcher. We're going to need to get to work on changing that ASAP, or we're going to get absolutely shrekt. Strive to survive difficulty is no joke in these circumstances. To speed up the research, Lewis ordered that one stack of each of the most common materials be placed in the lab. This should really cut down on the time they spend hauling stuff to the bench, and it is much easier to dump a bunch of paperwork on top of a pile of uranium if it's already right next to you. And indeed, it worked. The crew got plumbing researched in record time and immediately put their newfound liquid storage knowledge to use by crafting up some M62 fragmentation grenades. They needed to pull some camp fuel out of the tanks to do this, so Martinez built a tap. Truly, he is one of the engineers of all time. Uh, Watney, sleep is for people who don't have frag grenades to make. Day 102 opened up to a strange message arriving on the comms console. Some distant engine of happiness had woken up and started broadcasting lo-fi beats to chill slash study to directly into the minds of every male in the colony. Understandably, this mellowed them out for a few days. The beats weren't the only things flowing though, so Lewis ordered that the gang get started on a simple bathroom. <laughs> It's a poo joke! This would require them to carve out some more space and lay down plans for water treatment and storage. The problem of getting water on the moon was fixed by simply drilling straight into the ground. A single borehole and an electric pump would provide all the water we'd need for the foreseeable future. Day 103 saw Vogel lay out his plans for the bathroom, being certain to install pay points at each of the doors in true German fashion. A water tower would ensure that the toilets would continue to work during solar flares and continued bouts of shed loading. Lewis then accepted yet another quest to build Jeff yet another monument in exchange for access to a Silink Neuroformer. This handy piece of tech would allow us to give one of our colonists psychic powers. No psychic could have ever foreseen this segue to our sponsor. Paid Shadow Legends is a free-to-play data harvesting application that tra- just kidding, nobody wants to sponsor us, yet. Instead, we fund this entire ridiculous endeavor through the generous donations of our patrons and channel members. 
If you'd like to see more of this content, then please consider supporting the channel directly through the links below. Plus, it'll give you something to brag about on your next big date. So, what do you do for fun? There is one thing. So, get this, right? Yeah? Every month, right? Yeah? I give this bold guy on the internet. Yeah? Money. Oh! And then I get to watch videos that other people watch for free. So, you're getting scammed. No, 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 no. See, uh, there are some benefits too. Oh, uh, okay. Like what? Well, I, I get to see some exclusive videos, as well as some behind-the-scenes content. Oh, okay, cool. Is, is it any good? Not really. Although there was that one time he ate an entire expired military ration. Huh. Plus, uh, there, there are other perks. Oh, I'm listening. Yeah, so like when I comment on stuff, you can see my name. But you can see everyone's name. Yeah, but mine's green, and I got this really cool badge next to it. See? See? You're not... you're not looking? Oh yeah, very cool. And I get all these cool emojis that I can put in the comments and on live streams and stuff. No way, huh? You betcha. Plus I even get a special role in the community Discord server. Linked in the description. Join now or remain single forever. Day 104 saw more waterworks? I sure hope it does. The gang now had functional sinks and showers, but they'd still need somewhere to put all the, uh, colonist extract. So Vogel planned out a septic tank for that purpose. Speaking of a box filled with feces, Martinez planned out Jeff's new monument, and as if to celebrate, mounted his new throne and took the very first poop on the moon. Ha! <laughs> Take that, Louis Armstrong. Since the gang would need to be alive to produce sewerage, Johansson suggested that they first switch their focus to gunsmithing. God damn it is good to see a patriot! Watney and Beck couldn't shoot. Damn liberals. And so they got the EMP launcher and frag grenades respectively. Day 105 was all about strategy. Uh, do we arm the child? That's the real question. <laughs> Vogel got to work crafting the first shotguns, producing a masterwork on his first try, and then started work on a uranium mace. Now this wasn't just for smashing pumpkins, but also mechanoids. Pawns in RimWorld will stop using their ranged weapons once they enter melee combat, meaning we could use this gas-powered stick to tie down any scary mechs that get too close. Day 106 saw the gang improve their lumbar support by building stools in front of each workbench. This only gives a small comfort bonus, but it's usually enough to stave off any debuffs. Martinez got the mace, and Johansson got herself a shotgun. And a handy dose of freedom, goddammit! They also queued up a chain shotgun, because they were all out of ropes. Teddy embraced her proud British heritage, and picked up that golden knife we done made a few months ago, innit? That's, um... <laughs> That's quite... <laughs> Ah, <laughs> the moon madness, it's set again. A little bit of smoothing rounded off the bathroom. Polished moon marble poops. The luxury. Also, Teddy turned the TV back on. Uh, no idea how long that's been off. Day 107 was a big one. The gang got their very first orbital trader. Lewis scrambled over to place her order off. 55 off burgers, 55 fries, 50, 55 tacos, 55 pies! But all they had was this lousy tier 3 crafter bot from the miscellaneous robots mod. We traded our entire stash of gold for it, and I really wasn't sure that this was a good deal just yet. Regardless, Martinez installed it in the workshop and took a look at its specs. With 12 skill in all crafting related activities, it was instantly the second best worksman in the entire colony. Eh, sorry, Watney. The gang built a smelter so that it would have something to do, and set it to work smelting all the steel slag chunks your mom left lying around the map. Lewis then picked up her new rope shotgun and ordered that no one was to do any more crafting, so that they could focus on all the other jobs that needed doing, like pooping. Day 108 saw the gang start work on the new monument, which required them to gather up some more slate. The crafter bot was already proving to be an amazing investment and began absolutely powering through all the stone chunks the team was producing. 
Beck, being the complete sociopath he is, took issue with the distinct lack of war crimes being committed around here and got to work researching IEDs. Then, Moon Halibut. That is all. It is literally raining fish. Day 109 brought with it the forbidden knowledge of crafting concealed explosives. The crafter bot, in a feat of incredible self-loathing, I guess, got to work on crafting some EMP shells. These only affect mechanoids and, I guess, robots too? That wasn't the only shocking revelation though, as Luis and Martinez announced that their wedding was on. Uh, surprise, I guess. Not even gonna send out a damn save the date? Ha, huh, millennials. They probably should have hired a planner though, as giving your vows next to the poker table was quite the... Gamble? After smashing their helmets together for a few minutes, the gang got to socializing. Okay, so we do actually have some interesting dynamics here. Ooh. He absolutely hates the child. This is our doctor, by the way. I mean, that tracks because he left her on the goddamn floor. As you may be aware, we enjoy asking the large questions on this channel. Why are we here? Who are we? Who ate the last taco? Are moon pears real? Day 110 sure thinks so. Work continued on the monuments, and after carefully assessing their storerooms, Watney decided the time had come to sow a little old-school Coca-Cola attitude. Lewis also made the brave decision to abandon a seven-year-old child to be eaten by polar bears, and was rewarded with some moon peppers. What the hell is this game? Day 111 was all about youth empowerment, as Lewis ordered that every child in the colony should get a shotgun all of their own. Yes, my robot. Yes. Fabricate the firearms. Not wanting our Roomba to feel left out, she also ordered Beck to work out how to put a gun on a tripod and call it a turret. Truly, a Rimworld moment. In keeping with Lewis's plan, Teddy gained full American citizenship that day. Okay, listen, listen, the knife was really funny, but... <laughs> And we had an improbable meteorite strike. Oh, shit. How the hell would limestone end up in space? You know what? You know what? We don't ask those kind of questions. Day 112 was a busy one. The gang relocated the water facilities to be more out of the way, and a solar flare whipped through the base and took out our narco crop. Despite the setbacks, Martinez finished his work on the monument, and Lewis got herself a sweet new prefrontal cortex. This gave her the word of trust power, allowing her to recruit prisoners more easily, which is quite possibly the least useful thing I can possibly imagine in this scenario. I don't know about you, I haven't seen many prisoners in the past 112 days. Unless you count the entire colony, I guess, that it's not exactly a voluntary vacation here. She'd now need to spend some time each day meditating to build up her psi focus, and so she ordered that another sculpture be made for her to sit on the ground and stare at. Ironically enough, day 113 was a lucky one. For the comment section, as I finally remembered to prohibit the crew from eating raw food. As we all know, starvation is a much better alternative to inefficiency in the Rimworld community. Continuing this tradition of outreach, Martinez got to work rehoming all the lonely poop we'd been dumping into that septic tank. Now it would have a beautiful cave all of its own to call home. While planning a dance party to celebrate their newfound charity, it finally happened. Our very first mechanoid raid. They deployed a camp just west of our base and immediately went to sleep. Just goes to show you can't find good help anywhere these days. Past me is on the scene with the latest scoop. All right, so it's auto deployed into a base. We've got one, two, three mini slugger turrets, which are lit really scary. They're kind of like rifles. Uh, they've got really, really, really crazy range. Uh, we have an auto charge turret with a pretty decent range as well. We've got a pikeman who's also got, this is very much a ranged segment. Um, a scorcher, which is very short range. And uh, those guys got a little shotgun. All right. Now, rather than deal with the enemy on their doorstep right away, Lewis made the call to prepare a little bit more before attacking, and made sure no one would get too close. Johansson also suggested that they look into something a little bit more long-range than a shotgun. Day 114 brought with it a most enticing offer. Looking after two tribespeople in exchange for a moon tornado was just about the funniest thing I could think of, so of course we said yes. 
we should obviously take the gold, obviously. But I mean, are you Moon Tornado? Are you freaking kidding me? The gang spread themselves out to carry their new friends through the airlocks wherever they might land. We're gonna have to grab them instantaneously. Glover, get inside. Peluso, get inside. Oh, they lived, they lived, okay. After a successful entry, it was time to do a little science. Uh, I'm going to decompress Peluso here, just to see if it still works. Sorry, Peluso. Oh, okay, okay, it still works, it still works. Put it back, put it back, put it back, put it back, put it back. Oh, okay. Okay, yep, no, decompression still working, we just got lucky. Right as the gang finished researching gun turrets, the next bout of load shedding hit. Ah! Uh-oh. Coincidence? I think so. And remember kids, when in doubt, quintuple your battery count. Artistic skill of 7. Not great. Bit like magic, my editor. A but um Magic, my editor, is amazing. Day 115 brought with it another trader, and Lewis decided to sell her new sculpture in exchange for a little cash. Day 116 was all about maths and mining. Martinez located a juicy hunk of granite stone which would make an amazing perimeter wall, and went to go dig it up alongside some steel and some uranium. Another orbital trader showed up, and this time they had a neurocalculator for sale. Never again would Johansson have to suffer the shame of counting on her toes. Glover decided to tag along while Beck opened up a lady's skull, and to be completely honest, I'm beginning to see why he hates children. Our guests weren't exactly happy with their, uh, accommodations, and so Watney decided to give them another bed. Charity really does begin at home. Day 117 started with steel raining from the sky, lending some credence to all those comments we got about the moon steel just being a bunch of ancient smushed up spaceships. No more ludonarrative dissonance here. The crafting bot got started on the first of several sniper rifles. Martinez threw together a steel weapons locker to store them all in, the new battery bank was completed, and Lewis got herself a meditation spot. The rarest of all the moon flora then landed, the mighty bell pepper. But the mechs were hoarding them all for themselves, as selfish gits. On day 118, I uh, forgot to hit record. And you cut to the screenshot of me having made 1,000 plus videos and having 2,000 plus hours in RimWorld and having no hair and having all my friends call me ugly in the group chat and, and breaking my kneecaps and stomping on me and not even calling me daddy and... Uh... <clears throat> anyway. Day 119 opened explosively. The crafter bot had completed the rifles during the Day 118 media blackout, and some mechs kindly volunteered themselves as target practice. As the gang didn't have perimeter walls set up yet, the mechs just waltzed right on in and started blasting. Yes, it's stunned. Okay, hit it with the nades, hit it with the nades, quickly. Now move, now move. There we go. Oh, nice dodge, nice dodge. Keep him, keep him stunned, Watney, keep him stunned. FaZe Clan Beck scored the very first kill of the series with an absolutely insane grenade throw. However, both he and Johansson had taken some nasty hits in the fighting. Using their jump packs, they were able to get to cover quickly and rushed off to the hospital to patch themselves up. Watney is the frickin' MVP of this match. Okay, that thump cannon can do some real damage. Oh! Watney continued to stun the mechs while Martinez and Lewis hopped around to flank them. A few lucky shots later, and the threat had been dealt with. This was a serious wake-up call, though. Mechs are no joke. Beck continued his proud tradition of being the worst doctor in the solar system. Uh, have these people been dealt with? No. Beck, get to work, buddy. You are quite possibly the worst doctor in human history. And Martinez continued his own proud tradition of being one of the engineers of all time. Teddy decided to lend her TV to the injured band members as a way of saying thank you for eating all that shrapnel. The gang rounded out the day with a sweet ass party. Lewis then ordered the crafter bot to get started on some new spacesuits to replace all the damage caused by the battle. Day 120 marked two full years on the moon. Somebody free me from this nightmare. To celebrate, our guests pissed on the floor. Vogel got started on a new bathroom for them, and I insulted a child. Glover is pissed off again. 
And it is because they are learning starved. Uh, well, why don't you go do something, you idiot? The entire colony must be on TikTok, as everyone's been taking cold showers since we added them. Rise and grind, baby. Same 24 hours. Day 121 saw the gang get started on their robotics program, but without silver to make more complex logic chips, it would still be a while before they'd be making their own Roombas. To soothe his misery, Vogel planned a new bathroom. Day 122 was a cause for celebration. Watney's potatoes had finally grown to harvest. This is actually genuinely quite a milestone. They have been in there forever. He also realized that they'd already outgrown the resources this moon could provide and that they'd really need to start looking into asteroid mining. A cargo rocket and its launch pad would be all they need to get started. Day 123 was all about cleanup. The crafter bot shredded all those mechs into useful components, and someone dropped a big old chunk of jade right outside our base. Day 124 put the D in DEA, as the crafter bot got to work processing all the psychoid leaves Watney had just harvested. Now, piles and piles of white rectangles would look a little bit suspicious to our guests, so Martinez decided to stash them away in a brand new medicine cabinet. A plasteel meteorite rounded out the day and all but guaranteed that we'd never need to go mine anymore. Day 125 saw Lewis get ahead of the impending drug problem with a blanket ban on all narcotics. She then immediately fell into a fit of rabid artistic endeavor and started work on three new jade statues. I wonder where she got the energy. There must be a celestial being out there somewhere cleaning out their basement because a giant hunk of gold then floated past the planet. The team made some quick preparations to wrangle it before it got away. Day 126 marked the first time the team had left the moon since they arrived all those years ago. Luis and Martinez launched themselves up off the surface in that janky cargo rocket and immediately set up shop next to the asteroid. The return mission was of the utmost importance and so after dousing some ore, they got to work on the return rocket and then started mining. Day 127 saw our guest shuttle arrive to pick them up far, far away from the airlock. Uh oh, the walk would almost certainly kill them, so Watney and Vogel threw up a quick emergency tunnel to get them to the ship. It worked, and the gang got their tornado generator and a psychic sooth pulser to boot. Work continued through the night on the gold asteroid and wrapped up on day 128. The Bilta Loda had dug up an unbelievable 1700 gold and started loading it up on the rocket for the journey home. However, being one of the engineers of all time, Martinez got the fuel calculations wrong and they couldn't make the trip with what they had on hand. Letting the asteroid drift a little closer didn't help as this seems to be some fixed fuel cost that the mod introduces. Another rocket, carrying an additional 450 liters of fuel, was launched over and this proved to be enough to get them home. The sweet spot seems to be around 500 tiles of travel distance, by the way. While all of this was happening, another mech cluster landed to the west, this one much bigger and with a toxic waste spewer in the center of it. We cannot catch a break here. Day 129 saw Martinez equip the tornado generator as the mechanoid presence was becoming an increasing concern. You see, all this additional wealth was beginning to raise the raid sizes, and the gang would need to deal with them soon or they'd be overrun. Johansson then demanded that a wall be built to keep out the Mexicans. Uh, I mean the, the mechs. Ickins. And that they pay for it. Now, understandably, the mechs laughed at her demands and her presidential reign ended with a pathetic coup attempt and a stark reminder to all democracies everywhere of the importance of maintaining your population's critical thinking faculties. <coughs> Sorry, uh, what were we doing? The child delivery tunnel was then disassembled. I think I'm losing my mind. In an equal but no less concerning bout of insanity, Lewis attempted to fulfill another set of contracts and ordered up another golden helmet and equa for delivery. Unsurprisingly, the caravan never arrived to collect them. Another mech raid dropped in and the gang charged them with their shotguns. Johansson took a nasty hit in the fighting and her left lung was obliterated. Ooh, ouchie, ouchie, we lost a lung, we lost a lung. We're getting raided almost daily at this point. 
day 130 was fully focused on completing the wall. Martinez planned out some embrasures, which is basically just a wall with a hole in it that you can shoot out of, and these come from the simple embrasures mod. He then dug up all the slate he could find, the crafter bot chopped it into blocks, and Beck conducted a survey of the local mountains to find any more hidden ore. Days 131 and 132 were pretty much exactly the same. The whole gang was straight up wallin' bro. Watney brought in another harvest of psychoid leaves and the crafter bot got to work processing it all. The deep cam vein to the south had run dry and so the gang decided to recycle some of the piping for later. Day 133 saw the next major breakthrough in robotics. As with intermediate research completed, the gang could now craft tier 3 bots of their own. Johansson then shifted focus to power production once again and started looking into industrial generators. Also, Moon Sushi. On day 134, the walls were finally complete. It was time for battle. The gang lined up on the western embrasures and began to fire down on the mechanoid cluster. The mechs guarding it immediately rallied and stormed the gates. Beck got an early grenade kill and Johansson made an impossible shot through a wall. Oh, what a shot! Holy sh**! Through a tidy little porthole. Actual FaZe Clan application. With the mobile units taken care of, the gang left for lunch while Martinez stayed behind to continue whittling down those turrets. However, just as soon as they were tucking into their afternoon soylent, another much larger mechanoid force dropped in. We cannot catch a break. They were kind enough to let the team know that they'd be preparing for a little while though, and so the squad sorted out to intercept them. This was their first time fighting these nasty laser boys, and, well, uh, things got a little heated. Okay, Watney, Watney's kind of a little bit very on fire right now. Oh, Watney might die. Watney, no. Watney, run, brother, run. Oh my god, Watney! He's so on fire! Run, Watney, Watney, jump jet, jump jet. Okay, okay, we're out of here. The gang retreated back behind their walls and started picking off the mechs as they passed around. Beck charged in with his grenades and joined Watney in the medium-rare Hall of Fame. Beck is very on fire. Oh, f ow. Do not lose your leg, sir. Oh, what a man. Lewis then 1v1'd a mech, in Minecraft, of course, and tied it down so Martinez could take it out with his rifle. Oh, f Battle of day 134. With the fight over, the gang headed back to the base and decided to take day 135 off to recover before dealing with the rest of the mechs. The repair bench added by the Mend and Recycle mod would take care of all those burn marks on the team's spacesuits, but that would also require them to take them off, so they'd need a clear map before they could risk it. Martinez went off to repair the damaged door and, once he was done, returned fire with Johansson. If they could take out the smaller turrets first, the larger ones would be much easier to handle. Reality then took another early vacation, as the crew was offered a large vanometric power cell. Oh my god! in exchange for looking after some sick chinchillas. Now, not only could they all do 180 kickflips, they were also rarely ill and would need constant medical attention. Um, for unknown reasons, the chinchillas have been targeted by an orbital mechanoid swarm. Lewis assured the owner that they had the only, and therefore finest, doctor in the system, and the animals were dropped off within the hour and taken to the hospital. Now, for those of you unaware, a vanometric power cell produces a constant electrical charge completely for free. This is beyond science. Day 136 gave us industrial generators, which were set up just in time for a solar flare to come through. In true Rim Rim fashion. Day 137 was all about mending. Martinez built a mending bench, and the crafting robot made us some mending kits. Magic insisted we give the thing a name, and thus Rob the Robot was born. I'm taking shots at the enemy. Day 138 saw Lewis issue several new apparel restrictions, which had the gang strip down to their undies and wait on their suit and clothes to be repaired. This also presented a great opportunity to cycle in some of the newer, higher quality suits that Rob the Robot had made for us since. The gods must be happy with the crew for taking in those chinchillas and not eating them. This is, this doesn't count. This is, I'm having this as a, as a yummy snack. As the skies literally rained mojitos and silver that day. The two things we've been missing most. Did someone say margaritas? No, Janet, it is 8 a.m. on a Tuesday. On day 139, the gang began planning their robot army. Also, apparently I said gang too much in the last one.
I don't know why you'd all gang up on me like that. I thought we were gang gang though. I thought you were my original gangsters. You look me in the eye and you tell me that that night meant nothing to you. Speaking of children, Mindy grew up and was definitely not almost accidentally enslaved. On day 140, the future began. Rob the robot finished crafting up a builder bot, and this thing is incredible. Not only does it build things, as the name would suggest, but it hits rocks until they are no longer rocks, but in fact become smaller rocks that some may call stones. They even get a 50% bonus to speed and yield at tier 3, which is what we're making here. The team needed more stone for their walls, and so Martinez got the new bot to dig out a large chamber in a nearby hill. Day 141 saw the gang continue work on the defenses. Friendship ended with Martinez. Builder Bot 3 is my new best friend. Mechanoid Cluster, no! A mech cluster with a sun blocker would be a real problem if it woke up. Now, thankfully, it didn't spawn with any proximity or countdown sensors, and so the team would need to activate it themselves for it to be a problem. That's what we call foreshadowing in the business, by the way. We'll get to the violence tomorrow, though. Today, last deal. Day 142 saw me profess my love for the Builderbot. Oh, and he fixes things. I love him. I love him. Builderbot Tier 3, Mi Amor, who was affectionately named Jazz. Apparently, love was not in the air, though, as everyone's least favorite couple, Martinuis, broke up. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. This is a bad time. Martinez and Lewis just broke up? Weren't they married? Martinez got stuck with a new room right next to the exploding batteries, and everyone got some long overdue furniture. Inexplicably, Martinez was the one to divorce Lewis. A bold choice, considering his only other options are a sociopathic doctor, or, God forbid, a German. Day 143 saw the gang activate the mech cluster themselves. Watney laid down suppressing fire with the EMP launcher while the rest of the crew fired into the cluster at range. This one contained both a centipede and a demolisher, both of which are extremely hard to kill. And just like that, Jazz was taken from us. Rest in power, King. After a brief skirmish, the mechs retreated back to their cluster, only for yet another one to spawn into the southwest. This is getting ridiculous. Now there are four of them. Ho. Lee Hell. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me with this? Day 144 saw the rebirth of Jazz and the start of a new golden age for all mankind. Apparently still on track to succeed in his mission to be the most hated man in the known universe, Beck tried mansplaining art to Lewis. How's Lewis doing? She got an... I mean, Beck is trying to mack on her now. Uh... <laughs> Beck tried to attract Lewis by exaggerating his own autistic skills. Lewis gave a minimal response. Wow. What, because what, she's the artist, right? Yeah, at 11, what's he at? Two. God, he is, he is just the worst, huh? Fully healed from yesterday's scuffle, the gang sorted out again to try and pick off a few more stray mechs. A couple of the smaller ones made it into the base, but were quickly dealt with. The big guy needed to be tied up in melee, however, and so the crew took cover in that slate chamber and set an ambush. Then it was just a matter of cleaning up the rest of them and the turrets. This gave the squad their first taste of real victory in weeks. Jazz came through and cleaned out the last of the debris, and it was like they were never there. On day 145, the crew rested. A genetic supplier arrived overhead, and Lewis traded some asteroid gold for some medicine, and a ton more silver for the robots. As the sun dipped down over the horizon, the team lined up against the western wall and began sniping down towards the second mech cluster, activating its defenders and killing Jazz yet again. The battle continued well into day 146, with Watney continuing his tradition of being a human campfire and being sent home to be patched up by Vogel. They would need ER robots as soon as possible, and Beck promised to get on it once the fight was over. One of the lances made it through the wall, and a mighty battle ensued. Jazz was revived yet again, and another, as yet unnamed robot, was added to the gang's growing Roomba army, which immediately got to work repairing the walls. Good boy. 
Watney realized that someone had been dipping into the uranium supply and proposed a few new revolutionary storage solutions for their resources. Bins. The chinchilla shuttle then arrived and Beck finally noticed that Johansson had lost a nose at some point. She promised that she'd look for it everywhere and so he promised to look into growing her a new one. ER bots would have to wait. Day 147 began with the chinchillas being sent on their way and the reward pods arriving right outside the base. Martinez set up the vanimetric power cell near the batteries with the aim to wall it in. These don't break down and I don't want to risk someone smashing it in a tantrum. Another monument quest arrived from Jeff and this time he was offering a marine helmet and some ancient cortical stacks as a reward. These are added by the altered carbon mod and grant your colonies a kind of immortality if you can successfully decrypt and install them. Jeff's new holiday home was huge, however, and so the decision was made to tear down the old chalets to build this one. Johansson nearly died of extreme malnutrition on day 148. I'm genuinely not sure why she wasn't eating, and this never happened again, so I guess it all worked out in the end? Regardless, the rest of the day was spent working on Monsieur Bezos's new chateau. On day 149, the crew sallied out once more to tackle that damn mech cluster. But not before breakfast. They're not animals, you know. Johansson was sent back to the base as she can no longer keep up with the rest of the troop. Missing both a nose and a lung has affected her breathing so badly that she can no longer move properly. They'd need to find a solution for this soon, or she's kinda useless in these situations. Despite being a woman down, the crew made short work of the remaining defenses. By exploiting the minimum range of the large turrets, they can be destroyed up close. Taking them all out added another two notches to their collective belts. Disabling the remaining debris yielded a shield core of all things. These are really cool and can be used to craft personalized shield belts with the right research. They're an incredibly rare asset and we're really lucky to have one at all. The bad boys are back, back again, ready to mine, mine a friend. Day 150 rolled around and marked two and a half years on the moon. Kind of an insane amount of time when you think about it. To celebrate, Rob the Robot crafted up another friend, this time a hauler bot, and the gang now had everything they'd need to set up an automated asteroid mining operation. Beck finished his research into bionic limb replacements, just as Lewis gathered the entire crew together for another one of her famous speeches. Let's have a nice leader speech, let's see what she's talking about. She spoke about how life is like dice offered thoughts on the harmony of the colony, and, of course, described how to be more like foxes, and avoiding skunks and buffaloes, all important things to do on the moon. She discussed seeing viscera during combat and explained the colony's enormous potential to avoid gorillas at any given opportunity. Because remember, the colony's enemies have terrible eyes, and they're always watching. Always. Oh nice! Uh, golden meteorite. Day 151 rolled around and brought with it a spicy gold meteorite. This must have forgotten to wash its hands, because half the crew somehow caught the moon flu shortly thereafter. <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> must have forgotten to wash its hands, really? That's the best I got? Yeah, let's be honest, that's the best I got. Alright, alright, again. This prompted a deep desire in Beck to investigate this newfangled germ theory business that everyone's always going on about, and so he started drawing up plans for a full-blown gene lab. Day 152 opened up to Mindy asking the mechs if their refrigerator was still running, which might actually be a hate crime in retrospect. You're researching things, Mindy. Wait, no, you're not. You're talking on the damn phone. Mindy, get your shotgun. <laughs> you and your shotgun get the hell out of here. The mechs weren't the only ones steaming, though, as Rob the Robot, first of his name, continued cranking out even more little Roombas to join the colony's growing army. Absolutely no way this backfires on us, no siree. 
Beck finally got around to starting that ER bot research, and the rest of the team was well on their way to recovering from the moon flu. Day 153 was Teddy's birthday. She must have heard tale about those old Earth birthday traditions, as she kept asking if she could light some candles, or set the carrots on fire, or maybe just Beck's bed? Oh, shit. <laughs> no! <laughs> Rather than give in and let her start her own waste incineration program, Lewis asked for a couple more days to consider it. Meanwhile, more mountains got munched by mad marauding machines, and also Martinez. For Lewis, Watney, Johansson, Martinez, Vogel, Teddy, and Beck, day 154 was just another regular day. They ran some power cables to the gene lab, tended to the plants, and continued resting in the hospital. Mindy, on the other hand, was not having a regular day. As she wandered the halls of the base, like she'd done so, so many times before, an overwhelming sense of the wrongness of things came over her. It all felt different, out of place, as if she was walking through someone else's memories of this exact space. Just as she was about to ask her sister for help, she felt the ground tremble with dozens of distinct impacts. Mechs. She'd only heard the stories up until now, what with the base having no windows and everything, but she knew they were dangerous. Mommy hasn't stopped coughing since the last time she went out to fight them, after all. She knew the drill, though. You get your gun, you get your sister, you get to safety. But this time was different. The grown-ups had come back inside earlier than usual, and they kept looking over at her and Teddy. Her mom was still shouting something when Commander Lewis came up to them, and explained that there were just too many mechs outside, that they would get through the outer walls soon. She marched the entire crew down to the Eastern Workshop airlock, and had them take positions near the inner door. You stand here and here, she said, and you shoot anything with more than two legs. Mindy was terrified. She hated this room, it was always just too cold, no matter how much Daddy tinkered with the radiators. She raised her shotgun, a gift from Dr. Vogel, and aimed it at the door. Captain Martinez was standing there, in the doorway, holding that big stick he was always playing with. He said it was made to smash mechs, and she believed him. The next hour crept by, painfully slowly. She could hear the sounds of the mechs smashing things outside, but it seemed like they weren't interested in coming in. Martinez inched his way forward until he was just outside the door, and that was when she saw them. They were tiny, strange-looking things, around the same size as her, but much more angular, with appendages jutting out at odd angles. They carried small shotguns, not unlike her own, and she wondered for the briefest moment if they might want to be friends. Before she could even move to ask, it began. The mechs swarmed towards the doors and began shooting. A stray pellet hit her in the shoulder almost immediately, but she was so panicked she didn't even feel it. She sent round after round, flying down the corridor, making sure not to hit her friend. Martinez was tying them down in the doorway while the rest of her strange little family fired over his shoulders and between his legs. Before long, he was standing over a pile of crumpled machinery and bleeding from all over. Beck ordered him back to the med bay and picked up the stick. There were still more of them. Mech after mech poured through the doorway, while the crew did everything they could to stem the tide. Teddy took two nasty hits in quick succession, and their mother screamed for them to get back to the habitation cave. Just as soon as she turned the corner, Teddy saw Dr. Beck collapse. The mechs poured in over his body, and sent all of the grown-ups fleeing towards cover. Her and Teddy stayed close to them, not daring to look back. Daddy went down next. The two men who had brought her into this world gone. All she wanted to do was scream, but her voice seemed to have left with them. The remaining crew crowded outside the workshop's inner airlock and prepared to face the rest of the monsters. There were still at least a dozen of them, far, far too many to fight. Then they were through the doors. Her mom went down almost immediately and Dr. Vogel leapt forward to drag her to safety, only to fall next himself. Before Mindy could even react, a slug whipped past her ear and smashed through Commander Lewis's helmet. Martinez was halfway through the door before the next shot caught through his suit and he collapsed on top of her mom. Her mother was gone. Her friend was gone. Their leader was gone. The man who built towering, ageless monuments in exchange for the medicine that had saved her young life was gone. In that instant, Mindy was alone. She felt everything around her fading away, growing even grayer than usual. The mechs were still shooting at her, and she was returning the favor, but somehow it 
it all felt muted. The sounds of gunfire and the screams of her family and her friends seemed to be coming from somewhere else, some time else. She closed her eyes, just as she felt another shell make contact with her chest. Everything slipped from grey to black. Mindy awoke on day 155 with a pounding headache and a distinct sense of narrative tomfoolery. She'd seen old Earth broadcasts on the TV of brave space explorers getting stuck in alternative timelines, only to return like nothing had ever happened. Maybe she'd slipped into someone else's world for a moment. Being four years old though, she decided not to worry about it, and contented herself with thinking of ways to replace Beck's pillar with a Claymore directional anti-personnel mine, trademarked. For the rest of the moon's inhabitants, it was just another day. Martinez and the Builderbots got to work removing some of the hills near the base to improve their sightlines. This is an incredibly tedious process in Rimworld, as your colonists will do everything in their power to bury themselves in rubble at the earliest possible opportunity. Dad, are you seeing this? Are you seeing this? He nearly died. I hate them. I hate them all so much. Ah! I even tried adding the Smarter Deconstruction mod, but it must be conflicting with something else and it just wouldn't work. I guess that means we're babysitting. Day 156 opened with a brand new addition to the Roomba army. The ER bot was finished and placed into the hospital. Work on the mountain removal and wall upgrades continued at a snail's pace. By day 157, Mindy had finally worked up the courage to tell her mom and Commander Lewis about her vision. They were a little confused by what she was describing, but agreed that they needed a better defensive setup anyway. Some interior walls were thrown together in an attempt to avoid what Mindy described, which again, luckily, never happened. Day 158 saw the gang continue work on the walls and head out to clear their sight lines even further. The roof does fall. The roof does fall. They crash around me, 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 me. They crash around me, crash around me My conscience calls It tells me to go home After far too many close calls, the decision was made to only allow the robots to do the mining work from day 159 onwards. If Martinez wanted to get squished, he'd have to patch things up with Lewis first. With the walls finally looking more complete, the crew turned their attention back to genetic research. Maybe they could repopulate the planet given enough time. Day 160 brought an end to the brief peace the team had enjoyed. A cluster of mechs landed within the walls in the middle of the night. The team sallied out to face them and made short work of the cicadas. The scythers were so distracted by the Roombas that they didn't even try to attack the crew themselves. This might be something we could use. Lewis took a few nasty hits and the ER bot proved its worth. Day 161 saw the final touches being placed on Jeff's holiday home. To his credit, he paid right on time with a brand new spacesuit, some gold, and three ancient cortical stacks. The team couldn't do much with these just yet, but soon they'd be able to decrypt them for their own use. For its bravery in the battle a few days ago, Builder Bot 2 was christened Baymax. May all who hear its mighty name tremble, shit, piss, and cum. A new quest rolled in right afterwards, promising some tasty rewards in exchange for fighting off several huge mech attacks. Lewis knew that their current defenses wouldn't stand a chance against the attacks of that size, and so she commissioned the construction of a mighty kill box. May all who enter its walls tremble <laughs> and come. <laughs> we got 2.9 days to build a kill box. That would make Jeff smile. The kill box necessarily needs to be as deep as the range of the sniper rifle so that we can actually hit the stuff coming in, and it's always a good idea to include a barricade outside the entrance to stop the enemy from being able to see into the box before they enter it. Otherwise they'll just take cover on your own walls and sort of defeat the purpose. Work on the kill box continued well into day 163. With nothing much to do now that the bots were handling all the heavy lifting, the gang decided to do a little science. Lewis put on that prestige marine helmet they'd received a few weeks ago and stepped outside to see if it would work as a spacesuit helmet. I sure hope she didn't pay too much for her degree, as all the air in her suit immediately vented itself through the giant hole in her visor. This is now canonically the second worst decision she has ever made. Hello, hello, and welcome back to Cooking with Largely. Today's dish is a special one as we're frying up some old school cheese, baby. That's right. 
the RimWorld Kill Box. Now you're gonna want to start off with a solid foundation on this one. Nice organic stone walls from end to end. But if you can't get them, then store-bought will do just fine. Slap in a handful of barricades around your entrance to slow down any unwanted visitors, and then get started on laying out those turrets. Now, we recommend that you place those behind an embrasure of your choosing, but if you've got a taste for vanilla, then barricades should work just fine too. Make sure to preheat your oven to 180C and throw in a few service corridors for 25 minutes once it's all warmed up. Now remember, some extra embrasures to seal in the flavor never hurt, darling. And neither do bigger guns, if you know what I mean. <laughs> That's all for now, folks. Tune in next time for our delectable Mario 64 speedrun recipe. Bye-bye now. Someone must have forgotten to preheat their oven because the kill box still wasn't done by day 165. Lewis ordered up another side of BuilderBot to help it along and Watney suggested removing the roofs to prevent fires from spreading. Another mech cluster showed up, but seeing as it didn't have a countdown timer, the decision was made to leave it be until the kill box was done. Day 166 rolled around and brought with it more work. The team added a dozen or so uranium turrets to the sides of the kill box, as well as a pair of dual autocannons. These would easily shred smaller mechs, but would have trouble with centipedes and the like. While the bots continued their endless kill box labor, the crew shifted their focus back to their primary mission, returning home. Bogle suggested the construction of a satellite dish so they could begin searching for mineral-rich asteroids more easily. A robot trader stopped by and Lewis traded some of the remaining gold for a compact weaponry tech print. I have no clue how effective a knee spike would be against a scyther, but better to have it and not need it, right? Lewis clearly wanted to test this out as she wandered directly into the new mech cluster. Oh, what is... Uh oh, I need to add this to the no-go zone. I forgot. Uh oh. No! Lewis! Oh, she missed. Oh, you idiot. Another pair of dual autocannons was added to the base box, and now all that was left was to add power. And uranium slug turrets. On day 168, they built uranium slug turrets. Day 169. Nice. The crew began building satellite modules to expand their search for silver asteroid life, and Lewis decided it was time for war. The gang switched on the kill box and lured the mechs in to test it out. Blast him. Very nice. Ow, 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 ow. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'd say it worked. Taking out the base proved to still be quite the challenge, and Watney went down in the fighting. To commemorate this historic day, Lewis ordered the construction of a museum and designated a nearby rock to hollow out. Day 170 saw work continue on the museum and some lights installed in the future gene lab. It was also time to do the old spacesuit rotor, and Rob the robot got to work repairing them as fast as the colonists could put them on. Day 171 was more of the same, with work continuing on the museum and the arrival of a combat supplier. Lewis was really tempted to sell their gold stores, but she knew they'd need some to build their ship. Regardless, a tech print for specialized limbs would definitely come in handy for when the crew inevitably resettles the planet. Those unstable power cells we liberated from the mechs were then put to use powering the silver mine. God damn, I love democracy. Day 172 opened up with the bots absolutely blasting through the underground silver deposit and mining up some more steel. The gang now had almost enough in the bank to build their shuttle. Speaking of grinding, the crew threw a dance party, but it was a bit of a flop. Worried that someone might start throwing a tantrum, Martinez suggested that they wall in those power cells along with the other one. Each of them gives a constant 400 watts of power. 400 W's, am I right? To vent their frustration, Lewis ordered the squad to gear up and venture out to pick off some of the new mechs. Not one to be denied a good time, Martinez decided to finally set off that moon tornado. Okay, okay, drop it. Oh yeah, baby! Oh god, that is very much heading towards us though. Run! Okay, the tornado, you're going... Buddy, I need you to... Could you just do one of those over there? 
Unfortunately, it didn't do much except wake the mechs up, which were dealt with by the killbox. Johansson took another series of nasty shots to the torso, but the ER bot patched her up no problem. A173 was an interesting one. Not wanting to fight that huge cluster of turrets head on, Lewis ordered the bots to make some mortars. They'd need to buy some reinforced barrels to do this, but that shouldn't be an issue in time. A quest then rolled in offering a Zeus hammer and some space teeth in exchange for seven days of psychic suppression. This would reduce the mental abilities of all men on the base to 50% of their baseline, which in Lewis's opinion wouldn't be much of a change. The women really are the main characters in this story, aren't they? The space teeth were great for the memes and were promptly installed in Lewis's jaw. But the Zeus hammer, whoo, the Zeus hammer was mighty interesting. This big old bonker comes with an EMP charge built in that stuns mechs while you're hitting them. Just about the perfect upgrade from that uranium mace that we totally definitely didn't die with during Mindy's dream. To stop them wandering outside the base without a helmet on, the men were confined to quarters until the suppression wave had passed. The crew was also right on the edge of finishing their shuttle and just needed a little bit more steel to finish it off. There was little time to celebrate though, as some more mechanoids were assembled. A single cicada! Oh no! Anyway, day 174 rolled around and ship! Oh my god! Ship! 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 It's here! It's here! Ship! Also, they launched some satellites, and only after 174 days of development. Suck that, Elon. With the ship built, it was time to run some more utilities over to it. The thing provides a passive 1000 watts of power, and uses chem fuel as, well, fuel. The ship was a little larger than anticipated, so the bots expanded the launch pad on day 175. This also marked the last of the satellite launches. With four of them in orbit, the gang could now find a second moon. Um, I'll let you guys decide in the comments. Which moon should we get to next? What should our second location be? Striped Baron or Water? While we let the Space Ghosts deliberate on that one, there were bigger plans afoot as the gang gathered up all the supplies they'd need to go down on their first adventure. Martinez equipped the Zeus Hammer and with their preparations complete, Team Rocket blasted off once again, this time down to the surface. They landed at the edge of the ancient gene lab and entered the facility. Uh, skeleton has seen better days. Me, you and me both, King. It was heavily damaged and much of the equipment was badly broken, but there were a handful of gene packs lying around that the team could use. Now, I've never interacted with any of these mechanics before, so I was really interested to see what all the fuss was about. We have Pale. It makes you very unhappy. Fair. What have we got over here? Here we go. Smooth t tail. Before the crew could do much more celebrating, though, a mech raid arrived back at the moon base. It was nothing the killbox couldn't handle, but Lewis thought it would be wise to head back anyway. It's not like the planet's going anywhere, after all. On day 176, the crew blasted off from a tic prior for the second time. However, as the surface shrank beneath them, they felt nothing but excitement. They knew they'd be returning home again soon. Another quest then rolled in to build Jeff a winter home in exchange for a Persona core. This is needed to actually beat the game, and so the crew accepted it immediately. Just as the mechs began their attack, a pair of belt goods and combat traders passed overhead. The killbox made short work of our visitors, and Lewis brought some medicine, cider, and reinforced barrels off the pair of them. One of the builder bots tried to 1v1 a mech and paid the ultimate price. The ultimate price being reincarnated about 20 minutes later and carrying on as normal, of course. Work then began on the gene lab, starting with a few gene banks to store our newfound treasures. With the mortars now built, Day 177 saw the colony found their military industrial complex. An armory and shell production line was set up and their research into xenogenetics finished. The genes were placed into the gene bank alongside all the other denim we had on hand. Lewis then decided to dip her toes into the Ottawa Convention of 1998 and placed a few landmines at the entrance of the delete in Minecraft Quadrilateral. Say that fast five times. Since the use of anti-vehicle mines isn't prohibited, I'd say we're all good, because the mechs definitely aren't personnel. That said, the gang then began their shelling campaign against the toaster army, and managed to hit everything except the mechs. 
Day 178 was nearly the end of this colony. The mechs must not have enjoyed the gang's new gift delivery system as they called in reinforcements right on top of the new armory. It's been up for a day, by the way. We That's gonna be a bit of a problem. The drop parts triggered the fuses on the remaining shells and set them all off in quick succession. Unfazed, the mechs burst out of their pods and quickly got to work dismantling everything around them, including our colonists. Vogel gathered up the children and sealed them in the hospital while the rest of the crew grabbed their rifles and got ready for a fight. With half the colony still under psychic suppression, they'd need to be extremely careful on this one. Lewis ordered them to take positions near the eastern airlock and Martinez got ready to ambush any toasters that took the bait. The mech's hive mind must have joined Mindy in that alternate reality because this time they weren't falling for it. Martinez took hit after hit trying to lure them in, but eventually Lewis ordered them all to sally out and take cover near the panels while Watney flanked from the north. Jansen went down shortly thereafter and Beck hauled her off to the hospital. Martinez tried to cover them with a few guerrilla strikes, but Watney went down in the chaos. The crew retreated to the hospital to patch themselves up and strategize. Watney managed to pull himself up while they were doing so and jumped out of danger. Knowing that something needed to be done, Lewis grabbed the Zeus hammer and jumped out to fight them while Vogel drew fire. She managed to take out a gladiator, but lost an eye in the melee. Watney charged out after her and went down almost immediately. Beck and Martinez were back on their feet at this point and rushed out to help, but with all the adults down or dying, Mindy knew she had to run and get her shotgun. The mechs then went after the mortars, triggering both but surviving the ordeal. Oh, come on! Yes, kill it. Oh, come on. However, this blew a hole in the side of the workshop, venting all the air into space. Mindy fled into the hydroponics cave and sealed the doors behind her. She'd be of no use to anyone now. The mechs then made their first fatal mistake, entering the base. The crew swarmed out of the airlock and began to tear them apart piece by piece. Lewis finished off the last of the cicadas and the day was won but only just barely. The 179 opened up to a scene of utter destruction. The bots got to work patching up the base while the colonists rested, and Mindy was freed from her leafy prison just as the solar array was trimmed down a little bit. Nearly everyone had lost some body part or another, and the decision was made to focus on replacements as soon as possible. Once the power grid was at least partially restored, work resumed on the gene lab. Maybe we could grow people parts. I still have no idea what any of these machines do, so we just made one of everything, including a decryption bench to finally make use of the cortical stacks. On day 180, Rob the robot made a bionic eye for Lewis. And, and that's literally it. Nothing else happened. And on day 181, the search for Johansson's nose continued. With the lab fully functional, Johansson got to work decrypting those cortical stacks. Once decrypted, they yield an empty stack that can be implanted into a colonist. This backs up their consciousness and effectively renders them immortal, provided you've got a spare body lying around and that the stack itself isn't destroyed. This is attached to the neck body part, by the way. Lewis was the first to receive the treatment, and since she was already under, she got a new bionic eye installed too. Watney followed suit with a stack of his own, and Teddy decided to light the base on fire. Completely normal behavior for a two-year-old. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. The kid went on a fire starting spree. Oh, and she cooked off my batteries. Teddy, Teddy, please, Teddy. We also finally managed to track down Johansson's nose, but it seemed to have belonged to a rat all along. Nose. I can make a rat nose. God damn it, all of that to make a rat nose? There were still plenty of missing lungs, though, and on day 182, Johansson began her research into some replacements. The third cortical stack was given to Johansson, and a series of buffer walls were built around the base to make it a little bit harder for our enemies to just move around so easily. Almost on cue, another mech cluster landed nearby, this time with a countdown activated. The bots got to work digging up some more granite, which makes excellent defensive walls, and the decision was made to start developing bionic replacements for all of our colonists. Moon cyborgs? <laughs> oh, yes please. Beck then went out to trigger the mechs into attacking. And by day 183, he was almost through their walls. The toasters kindly toasted themselves in the toasting room. Yep, best of luck to you guys. 
and we were rewarded with some ethereal mangoes. Cargo pods, we've got some mangoes, and they're gone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> A reliquary was added to the museum, and the crew sallied out to clean up the rest of that cluster. The bionics program continued into day 184, and the crew put down prototype vitals monitors to improve their surgery chances. Another mech raid landed outside the walls and kindly saw themselves in. How polite. On day 185, Mecha Lewis was born. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. On day 186, the crew decided to once again return to the surface. This time with the Haulerbots. The ship could power three of them at the same time, and they'd be incredibly useful down there. This gene lab was far less pleasant than the first, though. Monstrous hybrids stalked the corridors and proved to be quite challenging to deal with. <laughs> this lab had even more goodies to loot than the last one, though, including an Arco Centipede Gestator? Whatever that is. And the gang piled it all up for transport. On day 187, the crew returned triumphant and began to set up the rest of the lab. They were going to need more room for all this random junk they'd acquired. Work began on Jep's, uh, marital aid, and the bots made short work of it. Day 188 brought with it some moon lobster. How about that? The lung research then finished and production began. Reality took its next vacation as the crew was offered an Arcotech arm in exchange for fighting a handful of mega slots. Is it the beavers all over again? I will get uh, free, 28 free mega sloth. Ah, uh, there's more people than I expected there to be. Apparently this also came with some archers for us to use who got to experience what boiling saliva feels like firsthand. Uh, you are all children to me now. Jeff's monument to ED was completed, and the gang got their Persona core stored away safely. The new equipment was moved into the new lab, and I invited new forms of mockery in the comments. I don't know what we're forming. I don't know if the centipede is human. I don't know what's going on. I've never interacted with any of these mechanics before. So uh, once again, feel free to mock me down below. The genomes we'd liberated from that base were beginning to decay though, and so Lewis ordered them to be placed in a freezer on day 189. <gasps> ooh, 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 we can make a thing, guys. Okay, let's make a thing. With the power of God at their fingertips, the power to create life as easily as they took it, where only their imagination was the limit of their power, the gang chose to make a dog. The slots arrived, and well, that went about how you'd expect at this point. The archers, their mission now complete, decided to take their leave and walk out of the airlock. That went about how you'd expect at this point. Okay, um, strip him. Waste not, want not, Beck always says, and got to work extracting their genomes. Research then shifted back to the bots once again, as another crafter would be amazing. Day 190 was a little panicked. It started off with Lewis commissioning a freezer to store the new genomes in, and ended with the best depiction of a panic attack ever caught on film. Uh, 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 uh. If the gene lab was too cold, our doggo embryo would just die. And then I would. Day 191 went a little bit smoother. The room had warmed up enough for Beck to transplant the embryo into the Electro womb to gestate it. Alright, so now he's growing in here? Look at little doggy! There he is! Not wanting to slow down now, the gang then headed back to the surface to scrounge up some more genes. They decided to also swing past that village while they were down there and hack some ancient PC for the first piece of intel as to the location of that relic. The locals did not take kindly to this behavior and the squad was forced to take action. Step 1, what me G for the love of god, do not shoot them. Uh, step 2, combat command from Lewis. And then melee attack. Damn it! Okay, I need you. To, I need you to not kill anyone. Unfortunately, they must have trained in the United States, as they'd never heard the words "non-lethal force" before, and wiped the entire village out. Just, just knock him out. Just knock him out. Oh God, damn it! He hit her. He punched her head off. Stop shooting, please, Lewis. God. 
Uh, and she's dead. Okay, well, that, that went about as expected. As they were plundering the place, another raid showed up, and the crew were finally able to take a few prisoners. Day 192 opened up with one raid right on the back of another, forcing the gang to abandon the prisoners and escape. Some peasant took the Zeus hammer and ran off with it before they could stop him. They gotta take my Zeus hammer! Lewis! Lewis! Quickly! Blast him! Lewis! I stole my f Zeus hammer! But rather than risk losing anything else, the crew packed their bags and shipped off back home. Our little doggy was almost finished cooking, and so an airtight tunnel through to the main base was planned. How close are you? Doggy! This is the most important part of the whole process. Doggy must live. Everybody's injured, everybody's dying, but Doggy, Doggy will thrive. You hear me? Vogel, get over here. Vogel stood ready to pet. Oh, look at him. Snuffles popped out of the womb, fully formed and ready for some love. The gang gave him a comfy bed to sleep in and started on his training right away. With the success of the canine program behind them, Beck got to work creating a race of lizard people. Day 193 brought with it our next ethical quandary. Yet more refugees had arrived on the moon and were requesting asylum. But that didn't go so well last time, did it? No more refugees on the moon. Martinez broached the absolutely unhinged idea of walling off the entire map to create a safe space for them to hide out in, and everyone was immediately on board. As if to put a dampener on this blatant copyright infringement, Mr. Samuel Streamer sent another wave of mechs to harass us. Despite putting up quite a fight, they were still kind enough to process themselves into slag for the team to refine. Oh yeah, oh yeah, we're fine. Oh, we're gonna be fine. Oh, maybe not. They're getting kind of close. Well, there go the fire foam poppers. Oh, those shield mechs, dude, if they coordinate a little bit better, we would actually be in serious trouble here. On days 194 and 95, the work on the Great Wall continued. The plan here was to provide an airtight space that the refugees could shelter in while the crew brought over some of the spare spacesuits. Days 196 and 197 saw power being run to each of the walls to eventually heat up the spaces between them. A decision was made that if the refugees showed up near the mechs, the gang just wouldn't be able to help them though. Some genius then stashed the lizard man genome in the freezer. Sorry, Mark. And so work began anew on cooking up a man-man instead. Day 198 was Teddy's next birthday. She picked up some horrendous traits loafing about the place, but making her dull and yet social seemed like the lesser of three evils. She'll be an aristocrat in no time. Another quest came in from Jeff shortly thereafter, offering a Resurrector Mech Serum as a reward. The crew gladly accepted, as this could bring back any one of them from the dead at any time. Speaking of time, the refugees were due to arrive any second now. The gang rushed to finish off the wall, while flashbacks to the horrors of their last encounter with Charity played through their minds. This time, they would save them. The crew spread themselves out around the map and waited patiently for the signal from their new arrivals. They appeared in the northwestern corner of the wall and immediately scurried towards the airlock. One of their number, Chef, was a little slower than the rest and began to fall behind. The decompression quickly downed him, and he died shortly after. The rest of his friends immediately turned hostile, and the crew employed their professional police training to predictable effect. I'm going to get uh, Lewis to go and melee this nine-year-old child, and hopefully not kill her. Good job, Lewis. Hi, right, well, a bit of a failure, but we did get one person at least. Nah, she died. On day 199, the crew put down Jeff's monument marker just like they put down those civilians. Am I right, fellow donut enjoyers? <laughs> Mindy had a growth moment of her own shortly afterwards and became a jogging intellectual. The crew was then rewarded with the discovery of another gold asteroid in orbit, which they immediately set out to mine. Unlike last time, this one would be run by the bots. Martinez, let's get these set up. Oh, I didn't bring any 
freaking power source. The ship can't be the power source. The ship's gotta leave. With power in place, the bots got right to work. After all, there was gold in them there heels. Safe in the knowledge that their future was looking far more secure, the crew of Luna 3 turned their gaze skyward once again. Hanging there, as if suspended in a sunbeam, was their home. It had been taken from them once, but now they had the means to take it back. Lewis, Watney, Johansson, Vogel, Mindy, Teddy, and yes, even Beck, have grown so, so much over the course of this series. From a bunch of bumbling, incompetent fools to the battle-hardened survivors they now are. However, their future is far from certain. Will they return to Atik Prior, or will they conquer new moons and plunder the stars for their riches? Will Mindy's vision come true? Will the Roombas ever rise up and join their Amazonian brethren in purging the last traces of life from this rock? And, most importantly of all, will Johansson ever find her nose? Until next time, Traveler, Atik Prior will be waiting for you. Oh, there's a meteorite heading into the planet. Check that out. Oh boy, I sure hope that doesn't land on my head. I sure hope that doesn't squish me like a little bug boy. I sure hope that doesn't just end all the suffering. <laughs> that would be terrible. <laughs> Gotta do this f Transylvania exit again, man. I don't know. I keep branding myself into corners first. I'm bald. Can't ever grow hair again. Now I gotta be a freaking Mexican vampire, man. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing here. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> well, welcome. As the gang didn't have a perimeter wall set up, I just farted. I don't know if you could hear that. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> the cat left the room. <laughs> Regardless, the rest of the day was spent working on Monsieur Bezos's new chateau. Oh, oh, baguette maison de Bezos. Oh, oh. <laughs> wow, we're just slandering everyone in this one, huh? I'm studying French. I get to make the jokes, okay? An overwhelming sense of the wrongness of things came all over her. That's, whoa, hold on. That was the wrong phrasing. Oh, no, they did not. This is a child. This is a child. Don't say it like that. <laughs> Nefarious smiles, voice. Welcome, traveler. Attic Prior has missed you. My spleen is ruptured. No! No, not the spleen! I only have the one, and it's so expensive to have them replaced. Oh, California, why do you do me like this? And oh. <coughs> oh, God, that was one breath. Mm. We have learned a lot about making these videos since the first one was made. That one took a hundred days, and this one we're down to, what, 30? I'd say that's an improvement. Uh, but that should probably be B-roll, because that's way too long. But I mean, 30 days? Their mother are so impatient. Okay, maybe it's 40 days. But you know what? It's not a hundred, and that's what matters. You made it to the end of the video. Congratulations and thank you. That puts you in the top eh, 3% of viewers. Here's another video that YouTube thinks you're going to like. And here is a list of all the patron and channel member names. If you don't see yours on there, you can find a link down in the description where you can sign up and support this content directly. Uh, if your name is on there, well, you probably already know that, huh? So, um, what are you still doing here?